Hello friends, welcome to another important discussion that is oclomotor nerve palsy, that is third cranial nerve palsy. This is a very important topic in neuroophthalmology and this is something which is a very common clinical case in the exams. Presence of oclomotor nerve palsy can represent something which is life-threatening so it gives an opportunity to pick up something life-threatening early and refer for appropriate management what are the characteristic features of oclomotor nerve palsy first it's very important to remember what are the muscles supplied by the oclomotor nerve that is the third cranial nerve it supplies all the extracular muscles of the eye except for lateral rectus which is supplied by the sixth nerve and superior oblique being supplied by the trochlear nerve that is the fourth cranial nerve. So the characteristic presentation features will be drooping of the upper lid that is ptosis can be there due to the involvement of the levator palpebrae superioris muscle which is responsible for elevation of the lid. The eye is deviated down and out. It is because of unopposed action of the lateral rectus muscle which moves the eye laterally and out is because of the unopposed action of superior oblique which causes depression and intorsion that is turning in of the globe. When you examine the ocular movements, there will be restriction of adduction that is the eye will not be able to move towards the nose or there will be def defect in elevation or depression of the globe. So the moment that will be normal will be abduction which is outward moment of the eyeball. Pupil can be dilated in some patients. We will discuss about it at a later stage. Patient can present with binocular diplopia that is double vision when they are looking with two eyes together and when they close one eye the double vision disappears. Let us try to see few important things about this oclomotor nerve palsy like how is it classified, how to localize the site of lesion, what are the syndromes associated with third nerve palsy, how to investigate and manage it. The common risk factors for development of third nerve palsy are vascular causes like diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia and the other important thing is compressive lesions like aneurysm of the posterior communicating artery apart from trauma inflammatory causes etc mainly we classify the third nerve palsy into medical third nerve palsy and surgical third nerve palsy the medical third nerve palsy basically represents vascular causes like diabetes hypertension and it is characterized by pupil sparing third nerve palsy the pupil will be normal on the other hand the surgical third nerve palsy is due to aneurysm involving the posterior communicating artery and internal carotid artery and it involves the pupil so the pupil will be dilated and fixed let us try to localize the site of lesion if it is a nuclear lesion the lesion will be in midbrain due to any reason it will cause contralateral superior rectus weakness or sometimes it presents with bilateral ptosis because of the bilateral innervation from the single nucleus. Next is the lesions in the fascicles. This is something which may be quite important from exam's point of view, like Weber syndrome, where the lesion is at the cerebral peduncle, causing ipsilateral third nerve palsy and contralateral hemiplegia. Benedict syndrome is characterized by ipsilateral third nerve palsy with contralateral tremors or involuntary movements and the lesion is at the red nucleus. North Nagel syndrome presents with ipsilateral third nerve palsy and cerebellar ataxia and the lesion is at the superior cerebellar peduncle. Oculomotor nerve has got a long course in the subarachnoid space once it leaves the, the midbrain here it is at risk of compression from the aneurysms like that of a posterior communicating artery 
or from the uncle herniation due to hemorrhages or even raised intracranial pressure can cause compression of the third nerve. After traversing through the subarachnoid space, it comes to the cavernous sinus. We all know cavernous sinus has got multiple cranial nerves. So whenever there is a lesion in the cavernous sinus, we get multiple cranial nerve palsies like involvement of the third, fourth, sixth cranial nerve and maxillary division of trigeminal nerve causing pain. If it comes to the superior orbital fissure lesions, there will be involvement of the optic nerve in addition to the nerves that are already coming from the cavernous sinus. Another diagnosis of exclusion is Tolosa Hunt syndrome, which presents with painful ophthalmoplasia seen in lesions at the superior orbital fissure. How do the lesions in the orbit present? Once the oculomotor nerve comes into the orbit, it divides into the superior and the inferior divisions. So there can be isolated superior division involvement or the isolated inferior division involvement causing weakness of the particular muscles supplied by the superior division like levator palpebris superioris which is in responsible for elevation and superior rectus which is again responsible for elevation whereas inferior division is responsible for action of medial rectus and inferior rectus along with the inferior oblique. If there is any pathology within the orbit itself, it can cause proptosis, which is protrusion of the eyeball, and sometimes involvement of the optic nerve can cause loss of vision. How to evaluate a patient who has got third nerve palsy? The most important thing is to differentiate whether it is a medical third nerve palsy or surgical third nerve palsy. The most important clue is the age of the patient. If it's a young patient, and there are no vascular risk factors like no history of diabetes, hypertension, think of surgical third nerve palsy. A detailed history is very important, especially in regards to headaches, neurological history, or any history of previous malignancies or space occupying lesions, which sometimes can represent a metastatic lesion within the brain causing compressive third nerve palsy. Do a thorough neurological examination including all the cranial nerves, blood pressure, full blood count, ESR, CRP, urea and electrolytes, blood sugars and lipid profile is must in all the patients with third nerve palsy to look for the vascular causes. Brain imaging is a very important part of evaluation of the third nerve palsy. Especially if there is involvement of the pupil then the patient needs an urgent MRI or CT brain, preferably MRI, to look for any lesion along the course of the oculomotor nerve. So, if you diagnose a pupil involving third nerve palsy, then you need to get in touch with the neurosurgery or medics immediately referring the patient for further evaluation as it can lead to sudden intracranial bleed and death if not managed acutely. If the pupil is normal, there is third nerve palsy, then it could be because of the vascular cause. We can monitor it with good control of diabetes, high blood pressure and other risk factors. Monitor for any pupil involvement over a course of time. Even in medical third nerve palsy, if the nerve palsy is not improving with time consider neuroimaging to rule out other causes the typical of a medical third nerve palsy is it tends to improve over a period of time and the pupil is generally spared what is the role of an ophthalmologist once we diagnose it to be a third nerve palsy and uh, it has been referred to medics for further evaluation. Next comes the management of double vision or diplopia if the patient has got. You can do it by temporary occlusion or patching of the eye to relieve the double vision or sometimes prisms can be incorporated into the glasses. 
squint correction can be considered if there is no spontaneous improvement in the squint or the squint is stable for at least six months. So the take home message is in a patient who is presenting with third nerve palsy, look for involvement of the pupil. If the pupil is involved, then it needs an urgent assessment. Hope you liked the presentation. I would kindly request you to share, like and comment on the presentation. Thank you.